Good evening, I'm Alma Angeles, and you're watching Evil News International. Here are tonight's headlines. Pagasa placed more areas under signal number one as Neneng moves closer to Babuyan Islands and the Batanes. Neneng is the country's 14th tropical cyclone this year. And Australia reported the first fatality from days of widespread flash flooding, despite heavy rains easing and flood levels stopping out across much of the southeast. Hundreds of homeowners began a long cleanup after storm waters engulfed streets, houses and cars across three states, with Melbourne suburbs among the worst hit. Russian President Vladimir Putin said he expects his mobilization of army reservists for combat in Ukraine to be completed in about two weeks, and this would allow him to end an unpopular and chaotic call-up meant to counter Ukrainian battlefield gains. He also said he doesn't regret starting the conflict and didn't intend to destroy its pro-Western neighbor. And later, Scottish actor Robbie Coltrane, who played Hagrid in the Harry Potter films, has died at age 72. First in our news, Pagasa placed more areas under signal number one as Tropical Depression Neneng moves closer to the Babuyan Islands and Batanes. Now Neneng is the country's 14th tropical cyclone this year. Let's listen in. Ito yung ating uh, latest satellite animation na nakikita na natin itong kaulapan na dala ng bagyong si Neneng ay nakaka-apekto na ngayon dito sa Batanes, Babuyan Island at dito sa bahagi ng Cagayan. Kaya inaasahan natin na mapapaaga ng bahagya yung ating uh, mga malalakas sa pagulan at maaari na siyang maranasan ngayong araw. Now, within the day ay pwedeng maging tropical storm itong bagyong si Neneng at maaari nga tumawid at uh, tumawid, tumatawid ng isang severe tropical storm category. Category. At paglabas ng ating area of responsibility, ito ay magiging ganap ng isang typhoon. So nakikita natin, lalabas pa rin ang ating area of responsibility itong bagyong si um, Neneng on Monday. Sa ngayon, nakataas pa rin ang babala ng bagyo bilang isa. Dito pa rin sa Batanes, Cagayan, kasama ng Babuyan Island, buong Apayao, northern portion of Isabela, which includes Santa Maria, San Pablo at Maconacon, dito sa northern portion ng Isabela at Ilocos Norte. Now, Neneng is seen to bring wind signal number three as the most likely highest signal during its passage through the country. And Australia reported the first fatality from days of widespread flash flooding today despite heavy rains easing and flood levels stopping out across much of the southeast. Let's listen in again. What can we do? It, it, it is what it is. We, we live near a river. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event and uh, luckily we're insured. Oh, well, I'm feeling a little bit hesitant but I'm pretty confident that now that it's not raining anymore any longer, it should, it should subside. Hundreds of homeowners began a long cleanup after storm waters engulfed streets, houses and cars across three straits, or three states with Melbourne suburbs among the worst hit. Two very wet years have left much of eastern Australia sudden, and floods now frequently follow even moderate downpours. The apparent flooding victim was a 71-year-old man who was found deceased in floodwaters in the backyard of his property in the town of Rochester, a small town north of Melbourne. Police said crews are on the scene and police are attempting to get to the property, which is currently blocked off due to flood waters. The exact circumstances surrounding the death are yet to be determined. As the waters ebbed, residents were left wading through mudgate streets, passing collapsed fences, abandoned cars, tree branches festooned with debris. For some, the risk is not yet over, with water still funneling into all already swollen catchments. Australia's east coast has been repeatedly lashed by heavy rainfall in the past two years, driven by back-to-back -back La Nina cycles. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or FIVOX, placed the Bulusan volcano under alert level 1, meaning low level unrest. The volcano also showed increased hydrothermal activity and unrest. Take a look. 
Opo, uh, ito nga, tinitingnan natin ngayon ang, ang worst case scenario in case na mag-escalate yung uh, bulusan. Ano? Kasi uh, it will affect uh, more or less 95,000 individuals sa anim na munisipyo or 70 barangays sa uh, around bulusan. So kailangan po mag-restock tayo ng mga supplies na kailangan dyan. Kasama na dyan yung mga clothes, yung uh, ginagamit pag uh, nagkaroon ng ashfall or yung mga face mask na kailangan din ma-distribute kaagad. So so far uh, kasi initially no pag nag-escalate yan nasa 10,000 pamilya kaagad ang kailangan ng tulong diyan uh, kasi once nag-alert uh, level 3 and 4 tayo nagkakaroon na yan ng mandatory or forced evacuation. So habang uh, nasa alert level 1 tayo or even 2 uh, nagkakaroon na tayo ng uh, uh, mga review ng ating mga protocols FIVOC said very weak to moderate emission of steam-laden plumes have been recorded from the summit crater and northwest vents. Volcanic carbon dioxide concentrations measured in springs on the southeastern sector of Bulusan have been increasing since July. In conjunction with the increasing spring temperature and monitored hot springs on the southwestern sector since April, short-term inflation of the southern flanks of Bulusan has also been observed since April this year. Here. And tonight's other news rescuers today search for the last miner missing at a coal mine in northern Turkey, where a methane blast the previous day killed at least 40 people in one of the country's worst industrial accidents in years. The blast ripped through the mine near the small coal mining town of Amazra on Turkey's Black Sea coast shortly before sunset on Friday. Authorities said earlier some 110 people had been underground at the time of the explosion. Television images late on Friday showed anxious crowds, some with tears in their eyes, congregating around a damaged white building near the entrance to the pit in search of news of their friends and loved ones. Turkey's Madden is Mining Workers Union attributed the blast to a buildup of methane gas. But other officials said it was premature to draw definitive conclusions over the cause of the accident. Russian President Vladimir Putin said he expects his mobilization of army reservice for combat in Ukraine to be completed in about two weeks. Now, this would allow him to end an unpopular and chaotic call-up meant to counter Ukrainian battlefield gains. He also said he doesn't regret starting the conflict and did not intend to destroy its pro-Western neighbor. Take a look. То, что происходит сегодня, малоприятно, мя мягко говоря. Но это все то же самое мы получили бы чуть позже, только в худших для нас условиях. Вот и все. Так что мы действуем правильно и своевременно. И ставили перед собой задачу уничтожения Украины. Нет, конечно. Вот они взяли в свое время. <coughs> в Крыму проживает 2,5 миллиона человек, да? 2,400. Взяли и, и воду отрубили там. Ну вот. Войскам пришлось зайти и открыть воду в Крым. Вот как просто пример э, на логике наших действий. Не сделали бы вот этого э, действия, не было бы других противодействий. Бы. Вот мост взорвали, теперь нам нужно 10 раз подумать. Э, обеспечение сообщения с Крымом по, по территории, насколько важно это для Российской Федерации. Now, he spoke days after Russia unleashed a wave of missile strikes on cities across Ukraine that left at least 20 civilians dead. Mr. Putin said the strikes were in retaliation for the explosion on the Crimea Bridge, which he described as a terrorist act. The bridge is a logistically crucial transport link for moving military equipment to Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine. In southern Ukraine, Kiev's forces have been pushing closer and closer to Kherson, the main city in the region of the same name just north of Crimea. On Friday, Moscow installed authorities, uh, renewed a call for residents to temporarily leave. Take a look. Обеспечен всех бесплатным проживанием и всем необходимым. А тем, кто примет решение остаться на новом месте, на постоянной основе обеспечим жильем. 
The bombardment of the Kherson region is dangerous for civilians, according to Kirill Stremusov, deputy head of the pro-Russian regional administration, and he urged residents to take a trip for rest and recreation elsewhere. The Moscow-appointed head of the area had appealed for intervention. Vladimir Saldo suggested residents leave to other regions to protect themselves from missile strikes. Those departing would go to a Crimea, a Ukrainian peninsula Moscow annexed in 2014, and southern Russian regions. Kiev, which announced its counter-offensive in the south in August, said it has already recaptured more than 400 square kilometers in the Kharkson region in under a week. Meanwhile, Washington on Friday announced an additional $725 million in military assistance to Kiev, including more ammunition for the HIMARS rocket systems that have been used by Ukraine to wreak havoc on Russian targets. It brings the total U.S. military assistance to Ukraine to $18.3 billion U.S. dollars since the start of President Joe Biden's administration. The assistance will also include anti-tank weapons, anti-radiation missiles known as HARMS, vehicles and medical supplies, according to the Defense Department. And separately, Elon Musk said his SpaceX would not be able to pay indefinitely for the Starlink satellite internet vital to Ukraine's communications in the fight against Russian invaders. The U.S. military confirmed it was communicating with the billionaire's company about funding for the key network. Starlink, a constellation of more than 3,000 small satellites in low Earth orbit, has been vital to Ukraine's communication as it fights against Russia's invasion with SpaceX donating some 25,000 ground terminals according to an updated figure given by Musk last week. An analyst at London's Chatham House think tank said Russian President Vladimir Putin is turning to ever more desperate measures to ensure his political survival and give the country confidence in him again. Take a look. If he were to just do nothing, then his own position would be threatened by the right wing of a party, the war party, if you like, you know, those who are, if you like, more extreme on this war even than he is. So he absolutely needs something, not just to win the war, which actually he can't really do anymore, but in fact, just to show that he is still the strongman leader that most people in Russia still think he is. But that is, has been, ultimately, that is in doubt if you are continu continually um, uh, facing uh, a pummeling from a much supposedly weaker opposition in fact so I, I don't think it's exactly weakness other than the fact that the russians have been weakened by ukraine i think it is the fact that 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 putin needs to turn to ever more desperate measures and by which i mean the indiscriminate bombing of ukrainian cities in order to shore up his own position and to give the the people and particularly the generals in the russian army confidence in him again when the russians threaten something they tend not to do it and when they deny something, it turns out that they have done it. Uh, having said that, uh, as per my previous statement, I suppose, then it, it is entirely to be expected that Russia will uh, up the ante um, and increase the level and intensity of its attacks on Ukraine. Uh, not because of Putin has said it, but because he needs to, for his own political survival, quite frankly. Then I don't think that uh, Belarusian troops want to go to war for not even their country, not even close to their country. Um, and uh, I think they are, I think he will have a great deal of trouble controlling his own military. In tonight's other news, Scottish actor Robbie Coltrane, who played Hagrid in the Harry Potter films, has died at age 72. Take a look. Wizard Harry. I'm a what? Understand this, Harry, because it's very important. Coltrane also played a former KGB agent turned Russian mafia boss in two James Bond films, Golden Eye in 1995 and The World Is Not Enough in 1999 with Pierce Brosnan. Robbie was one of the funniest people I've met and used to keep us laughing constantly as kids on set, according to Daniel Radcliffe, who played the title role in the Harry Potter series. I feel incredibly lucky that I got to meet and work with him and very sad 
that he's passed, he said. A Korean-Canadian filmmaker's poignant coming-of-age story has charmed audiences at the Asia's Top Film Festival, where the director telling AFP he made the movie to help people like him feel a little bit less alone. Rice Boy Sleeps won a prestigious prize at the Toronto Festival, Toronto International Film Fest last month, but Anthony Shim's movie about growing up as a Korean immigrant in majority white Vancouver has also proved a hit in his native South Korea. Take a look. As there are stories being told now about the Asian immigrant story, the Korean immigrant story, I just felt like there wasn't anything that I was seeing that represented my experiences in the, in the way that I rem remember them. And I'm realizing that the trauma of, you know, having dealt, you know, like the, the, the trauma of that kind of insult as a kid is still affecting me now as an adult who is much more secure and, and, and aware of himself. Those events, along with so many others, have shaped who I am today, but they haven't left who I am. There's still there in me, the, the, the pains, the, you know, the memories are still embedded into my being. And there's a lot of people that I know who have experienced similar things and feel, have felt similar things, but feel very alone in that. Um, having been at, in times where I felt so broken and lonely, thinking that nobody else could possibly understand. Now, Shim himself moved to Vancouver at the age of eight with his family and has described growing up as often uh, the only Asian child in his class at school. Inspired by his own experiences, the film, set in the 1990s, follows a South Korean single mother who moves to Canada with her young son and the difficulties they encounter. The mother in the story faces sexist and racist treatment at work while her son, Dong Yun, is brutally mocked for his lunch of gimbap, Korean rice rolls, which he ends up secretly throwing away to avoid torment. Now shot on 6.10mm film, Rice Boy Sleeps captures the turbulent evolution of the mother-son relationship as Dong Yun becomes a beach blonde teenager and touches on death and loss. The news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be back. Stay tuned. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang pagharap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin to pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. Kaya mo pa ba na isipang mag-tiktok at bakit mo isipang? <laughs> Sila yaya! <laughs> Try mo lang mom, ganyan. <laughs> mom, ito yung gagawin mo. I-ready na namin, i-shoot na namin. Sila ang director? Seryo? Sila ang actual? Ang matuto? Oo nga eh. Kasi nakaka ba na ako tiktok account? So hindi ko nga alam pa paano ba yan. Kasi, try, try natin ngayon. Ngayon agad-agad? Yes! Ka, <laughs> Watch my heartfelt kuntuhan with Miss Gladys Reyes this week and a pause the moment. 
making life extra special. Welcome back. An entire human skeleton has been found outside Universal Studios Japan theme park, according to police today. After conducting a search following the discovery of a skull suspected to be part of it. On Wednesday, a Universal Studios staff member found what appeared to be a human skull and an upper jaw along with other bones while pruning plants by the popular amusement park in the western city of Osaka. Ten police officers then searched the area with two sniffer dogs and found the rest of the skeleton, according to an officer. Police will carry out analysis next week to find out about the gender and age of the possible deceased, Universal Studios Japan was established in 2001 as the first Universal Studios theme park outside the U.S. and is popular tourist draw. In tonight's other news, former President Donald Trump's response after the January 6th committee voted to subpoena him as new video from inside the Capitol on that day shows the fear and frustration of congressional leaders. But first, let's listen in. He is the one person at the center of the story of what happened on January 6th. So we want to hear from him. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. Reacting on his right-wing truth social platform, Mr. Trump said the committee was a total bust that has only served to further divide the country. He used 14 pages to vent his anger, disappointment, and complaint. And the letter begins with Trump's all-caps declaration, the presidential election of 2020 was rigged and stolen. Trump blames Nancy Pelosi for January 6, arguing that in the days leading up, she declined the use of National Guard at the Capitol. But no answer on whether he would comply with the subpoena to testify. If Mr. Trump doesn't play ball, the House can hold him in contempt of Congress, referring him for prosecution. The Justice Department could then drop the case, as it did with Mr. Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, or pursue charges as with one-time White House strategist Steve Bannon. Mr. Trump would face at least 30 days in jail if convicted, but few experts believe he would actually spend a minute behind bars. The DOJ will not take any public action before November's midterm elections in any case. Control of the House of Representatives is expected to flip after November elections to the Republicans who plan to immediately end the investigation. Meanwhile, disturbing video of party leaders desperately calling for help as the U.S. Capitol was ransacked provided a chilling twist in Thursday's session of the probe into the 2021 insurrection. Let's take a look. Surrounded. They're taking the uh, north front scaffolding. Unless we get more munitions, we are not going to be able to hold. The door has been breached. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? Well, I have something to say, Mr. Secretary. Well, I'm going to call the, the mayor of Washington, D.C. right now and see what uh, other outreach she has to other police departments, as the uh, leader Hoyer has mentioned. 
Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. They're just breaking windows. They're doing all, all kinds. Of, it's really that somebody, they said somebody was shot. It's just, it's just horrendous and all at the instigation of the President of the United States. Virginia Guard has been called in. Now, the panel also unveiled evidence developed from nearly one million pages of documents surrendered by the Secret Service as lawmakers seek to understand why certain agents' text messages from the eve of the insurrection and the day itself went missing. And now to a tragic and breaking story from Raleigh, North Carolina. Take a look. Now, we now know that five people died at the hands of a teenage gunman who held a Raleigh neighborhood in fear, forcing residents to barricade themselves inside their homes. North Carolina's governor calling it a nightmare in every community, and authorities said the gunman left a trail of victims in crime. The nightmare of every community has come to Raleigh, Governor Roy Cooper said. This is senseless, horrific, and infuriating act of violence. The 15-year-old is in custody and is in critical condition after a long standoff with police. The dead included a 29-year-old off-duty police officer who was on his way to work. The four other victims were a 16-year-old boy and three women aged 35, 49, and 52. A 59-year-old woman was also or also remained hospitalized in critical condition. Police are not saying what led up to that shooting, but that the entire thing is still under investigation. Now, the 15-year-old boy fatally shot two people in the streets of Raleigh, North Carolina, and then fled towards a walking trail where he killed three more people and wounded two others. Among the dead was Nicole Connors. Her husband, Tracy Howard, uh, told ABC 11 that he found his wife and his dog, Sammy, both shot dead on the front porch. A neighbor was injured and lying on the ground next to them. I froze. I didn't know what to do. You know, could have tried to perform CPR or something, but I just I just froze. Mm -hmm. So I called 911. Mm -hmm. That's all I that's all I could do. Yeah. Uh, she was um I can't you know, she was just a fun loving person. She was good people, she was a good person. Yeah. She took care of me, you know. She took care of her whole family. Mm. Now, Howard is in this belief that his 15-year-old neighbor is the person investigators say killed his wife. Sources have confirmed for the news observer that the suspect is Austin Thompson, 15 years old, a sophomore at the Nightdale High School, and the brother of 16-year-old shooting victim James Thompson. Austin is hospitalized in critical condition at WakeMed. Now, another mass shooting. A U.S. jury on Thursday rejected a death penalty and backed life imprisonment for Nicholas Cruz. The jury left victims' parents shocked and angry when they decided to spare Cruz's life, instead sentencing him to life in prison without parole for killing 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. Take a look. The first reading, okay, I mean, my heart just sunk. My husband grabbed my hand. I mean, grabbed my, look what he grabbed my hand because we couldn't believe that that it was going to be life in prison without parole. I mean, if there's no closure when your son has been murdered. There just is no closure. It's just like I say, a, a chapter being closed, but there is no closure. I'm disgusted with our legal system. I'm disgusted with those jurors. I'm disgusted with the system that you can allow 17 dead and 17 others shot and wounded and not give the death penalty. What do we have the death penalty for? What is the purpose of it? I sent my daughter to school and she was shot eight times. I am so beyond disappointed and frustrated with this outcome. I How can the mitigating factors? make this shooter, who they recognized, committed this terrible act. 
pressing the barrel of his weapon to my daughter's chest. That doesn't outweigh that poor little, what's his name, had a tough upbringing. Recognize what he really is. Melissa McNeil, a lawyer for Cruz, urged the jurors to show compassion. McNeil said Cruz was a troubled young man born with fetal alcohol stress disorder to a mother who struggled with homelessness, alcoholism, and drug addiction before putting him up for adoption. On February 14, 2018, then 19-year-old Cruz walked into school carrying a semi-automatic rifle. He had been expelled a year earlier for disciplinary reasons. In nine minutes, he killed 17 people and wounded another 17. Cruz fled by mixing in with people frantically escaping the gory scene, but was arrested by police shortly after he walked along the street. In other news, still in the U.S., the Department of Homeland Security announced that Venezuelans entering the U.S. by land will be returned to Mexico in line with almost all other migrants without visas coming over the border. The United States has shot its land borders to Venezuelans, and until now, they had been granted uh, exceptions because of Washington's distrust of the hard left regime in Caracas. The U.S. will instead allow 24,000 Venezuelans to use a humanitarian program. Now, that program is similar to a scheme that welcomed Ukrainians fleeing the Russian war. President Biden hopes to calm Democratic demands to help desperate migrants and respond to Republican calls to stem what they say is a tide of illegal migration. In tonight's other news, World Bank President David Malpass alerted that the world economy is way too close to a downturn and called for targeted assistance for the poor. Take a look. Uh, last week, so showing 70 million more people in extreme poverty and median income going down by four tenths of a percent. That's the first decline in the records that we that the World Bank's been keeping since 1990. The growth rate we've lowered our 2023 growth forecast from three percent to 1.9 percent for global growth. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, dangerously close to a world recession, and that a uh, world recession could happen under certain circumstances. Uh, all of the problems that, uh, that people have taken note of, the inflation problem, the interest rate rises, uh, and the, the cutoff of capital flows to developing world hits the poor hard. Uh, some countries have already been raising their interest rates and may, may be reaching a point where they don't have to keep raising. Some countries have done one kind of subsidy versus another kind of subsidy. Uh, and so, and, and uh, fiscal policies are different throughout. And also, very importantly, some countries are commodity producers and some are uh, commodity buyers. Um, so we've, in general, advocated for countries that when, as, as they address the crisis, that they try to have targeted, uh, targeted responses. That means support for the poor. Uh, that means uh, uh, interventions that are targeted and also are, are, uh, there's an exit strategy. They're temporary. Uh, um, World-facing, very challenging environment from the advanced economies, uh, and that has uh, serious implications, dangers for the developing countries. And my uh, deep concern is that these conditions and trends might persist into 2023 and 2024. World Bank has a has a mission of having shared prosperity, and that means in the broad sense, people's well-being going up. And the, the data from the poverty report shows median income going down for the first time. And so if we have a world recession now, uh, that would also depress median income, meaning the, the people in the lower half of the income scale are going down.
Meanwhile, the G7 is working on a set setting a price cap on Russian oil, but enrolling more nations to the scheme is not necessary for it to succeed, according to U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Australia recently joined the group of seven wealthy dem democracies and the EU in backing the move aimed at depriving Moscow of a key source of cash for its war in Ukraine, as well as cooling soaring energy prices. Take a look. Inflation is elevated in many countries. Growth is slowing globally. We're also seeing swings in capital flows and strong movements in financial markets. But we're taking strong action both in the United States and globally to contend with these headwinds. In the United States, our economy remains resilient, bolstered by President Biden's economic plan. But we're high, highly attuned to the risks of global headwinds. That includes those contributing to the high inflation we've seen in much of the world. Putin's decision to wage war in Ukraine has sharply elevated energy prices. That's hurt consumers around the globe. In response, the United States and its partners recently committed to finalize and implement a cap on the price of Russian oil. This policy has particular benefits for developing countries. A price cap will help stabilize global energy prices. It will also provide developing countries with greater leverage to negotiate better prices for Russian oil. Дополнительно не планируется. Я никаких предложений от Минобороны на этот счет не поступал. И в обозримом будущем я что-то не вижу никакой необходимости. Moscow has warned that it would cut off oil supplies to countries that impose such a cap. Oil prices surged to almost $140 per barrel in March following the Russian invasion. The international benchmark Brent has since hovered around $90. Western officials have said that the price for Russian crude would remain above the cost of production so that Moscow would still have an incentive to supply importing countries. Environmental protesters threw tomato soup over one of Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers paintings at London's National Gallery in the latest direct action stunt targeting works of art. Take a look. What is worth more, art or life? Is it worth more than food? Worth more than justice? Are you more concerned about the protection of a painting or the protection of our planet and people? The cost of living crisis is part of the cost of oil crisis. Fuel is unaffordable to millions of cold, hungry families. They can't even afford to heat a tin of soup. Meanwhile, crops Ten are failing. Millions of people are dying in monsoons, wildfires and severe drought. We cannot afford new oil and gas. It is going to take everything we know and love. People are dying in monsoons. Now, this is a protest group, Just Stop Oil. And behind the action, wants to end UK government approval for exploring, developing and producing fossil fuels and has mounted a series of high-profile protests. London's Metropolitan Police said officers arrested two protesters from the Organization for Criminal Damage and Aggravated Trespass after they threw a substance at the painting in the gallery and glued themselves to the wall just after 11 a.m. The activist group said the painting has an estimated value of 84.2 million U.S. dollars. Astronomers have observed the brightest flash of light ever seen from an event that occurred 2.4 billion light years from Earth and was likely triggered by the formation of a black hole. Take a look. 
It's really breaking records, both in the amount of photons and the energy of the photons that are reaching us, according to astrophysicist Brendan O'Connor, who used infrared instruments on the Gemini South Telescope in Chile to take fresh observations early Friday. Something this bright, this nearby is really a once-in-a-century event, he added. He also said gamma ray bursts in general release the same amount of energy that our sun produces over its entire entire lifetime in the span of a few seconds. And this event is the brightest gamma ray burst. The burst of gamma rays, the most intense form of electromagnetic radiation, was first detected by orbiting telescopes on October 9. And its afterglow is still being watched by scientists across the world. O'Connor said that gamma ray bursts that last hundreds of seconds as occurred on Sunday, are thought to be caused by dying massive stars greater than 30 times bigger than our sun. The star explodes into a supernova, collapses into a black hole, then matter forms in a disk around the black hole, falls inside, and is spewed out in a jet of energy that travels at 99.99% the speed of light. Meanwhile, NASA's Crew 4 mission returns home to Earth after 170 days aboard the International Space Station. The SpaceX Dragon Freedom spacecraft carrying NASA astronauts Kiel Lindgren, Bob Hines, and Jessica Watkins, as well as Italian Samantha Cristoforetti of the European Space Agency, splashed down off the coast of Florida around 4.55 p.m. This mission, called Crew 4, has marked a historic first with Watkins being becoming the first black woman to join the space station crew for an extended stay. During their stay, the astronauts conducted science experiments, including research on how to grow vegetables in space without soil and the study of space flight effects on the human body. According to CNN, those experiments are designed to help astronauts understand how they may one day grow their own food and how their bodies may react on missions deeper into space, such as on NASA's planned Artemis moon missions, Watkins said during a news briefing last week. In tonight's other news, British Prime Minister Liz Truss fired her finance minister after prolonged market turmoil. But some conservatives were plotting their new leader's own demise as her right-wing economic agenda imploded. First, let's listen in. I met the former chancellor earlier today. I was incredibly sorry to lose him. He is a great friend and he shares my vision to set this country on the path to growth. Today, I have asked Jeremy Hunt to become the new Chancellor. He's one of the most experienced and widely respected government ministers and parliamentarians. And he shares my convictions and ambitions for our country. We need to have a high growth economy, but we have to recognize that we are facing very difficult issues as a country. And it was right in the national interest that I made the decisions I've made today to restore that economic stability. Had, or the Prime Minister has had to find a way of suggesting she's moving on from the disastrous mini-budget uh, that her Chancellor, now ex-Chancellor, delivered very recently. And of course, it's been done by sacking the Chancellor, replacing him with a new uh, member of her government. And But whether that's enough to stop the problems she's got, I doubt. I mean, the initial reaction of the markets, both the financial markets uh, and indeed the political uh, system has been not massively encouraging for her. And I have to say that the press conference that she uh, gave, uh, I probably, I doubt it inspired a huge amount of confidence with her colleagues. So the markets don't look as if they're overconfident yet. I mean, it could change later this afternoon or on Monday. But the initial signs are, and some of the political signs, are that um, the change and the radical change of policy and the performance together probably haven't changed the, the mood and the wind, you know, the, the direction of the wind quite as much as the Prime Minister might have hoped. 
This is Kwasi Kwarteng, and he became the second shortest-lived chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK political history, paying the price after Truss's crash program of unfunded tax cuts terrified the financial markets. Truss did little to reassure investors and the UK electorate at a brief news conference, her first since succeeding Boris Johnson on September 6. She insisted she had acted decisively to bring about economic stability, but the pound resumed its slide on currency markets, falling under $1.12. We'll be back with more news right after this. Maraming pamamaraan para tayo ay magkaroon ng extra income. Mahalaga sa panahong ito na may iba tayong pinagkukunan ng kabuhayan para di na tayo kinakabahan pagdating ng pecha de peligro. For today's video, let us look into different ways on taking a side hustle that even promotes better well-being through all natural products. Let's be open for business with one of tea and build your wealth through health. Sa panahon po kasi ngayon, napaka-importante po ng kalusugan. Kasi po, uh, di ba may kasabihan po tayo, health is wealth. Kaya nga sinasabing, prevention is better than cure. Gagamitin mo, gagawin mo siya hanggat wala ka pang sakit. Para sa akin po, ang pinakamalawak na negosyo sa panahon ngayon ay walang iba kundi regarding po sa health. Open for business with Cesar Vallejos. Sunday, 9 p.m. Season 4 na ng Kigo Sile! Meron tayong bagong segment. On the spotlight. Ano kaso mo? Jay Walking po yan eh. Tagawo, appearance of ugly face. Dapat po yung for life, ginawa na lang for this. <laughs> Marami rin tayo mga bagong games! Ang tawag sa game ay Wiz on City. Merong mga letters. Ito lang kayo ngayon ng work. May nangyari na ba sa inyo? I am humbled that you can join me in unveiling to you a project that is dear to my heart. Dami mo na naging role. Anong pang hindi mo na gagawa? I really want to be a superhero. That, me that, too! If there's a dream. <laughs> How are you as a kuya? Are you as loving as a kuya as your dad? Madalas ka mautangan. Madalas. Hindi <laughs> na utang yun, hindi na lang. <laughs> meron sa Dumaguete? Um, my heart is in Dumaguete. Naklaman! <laughs> What do you call this dish? It's an Indian dish. Yeah. Gisa-gisa pag may time. What a real treat. Not everybody gets to go to the pad of Raymond Bagatsing. Next on Karina Interviews. Better watch. dito sa masayang Net25. Dadagdagan na tayo ng host, Yuki Takahashi. Tayana Meneses. Ang mga Tora Gamers na maglalaban-laban ngayong gabi. Dito si Abo. Hanapin mo na lang yung pinakagwapo. Ba't parang ayaw mo? <laughs> wala, wala na ba kayo makukuha? <laughs> Yan, eh po eh. Lilis-lilis ka po na siya. Eh po, ito po yun. Bakit mo? <laughs> I'm your Tora Game Master, Aga Bulak. And this is Tora Game! Agad! Agad! Level up! Welcome back. Members of the Iglesia Ni Cristo Church of Christ in Hawaii are on a roll in giving back to various communities. Most recently, the INC teamed with the nonprofit Blood Bank of Hawaii in hosting a blood donation drive that exceeded expectations. For more, we have Mio Asenas from our Hawaii Pacific Bureau. Statistically, every two seconds, someone needs blood. One out of seven patients that go to the hospital will need a blood transfusion. After a two-year pause due to the COVID-19 pandemic, members of the Iglesia Ni Cristo or Church of Christ have teamed up once again with the Blood Bank of Hawaii in hosting a blood donation drive at the INC Chapel compound at Eva Beach in West Oahu. 
It's very, very important. Uh, any host to a blood drive is called a Lifesaver Club. Lifesaver Clubs is exactly what it is. It saves lives. Uh, Igrisha Nicresto uh, has one of the largest blood drives to date on record uh, at two locations, Waipahu locale and the Ever Beach locale. Because of the ongoing uncertainties of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, both the INC and the blood bank implemented additional health and safety protocols to make sure that donors would be able to give blood without any worry for contamination. I really wanted to participate and um, help in the blood donation because it's actually pretty common that uh, there are a lot of people in need and we have a lot to spare and to know that I could be of help and of service is a really fulfilling um, feeling. Uh, the church's goal in holding uh, these activities like this is, again, first and foremost, uh, to help out the community. As a result, 76 participants successfully exceeded the blood bank of Hawaii's original goal of 50 pints, with a total of 67 pints of blood. We are very thankful and grateful for that partnership with Iglesia Necresto to continue to do this on an annual basis on all islands contributing to our blood supply. So very much appreciative of their support in their community. Other charitable works of the INC in Hawaii have included Care for Humanity outreach events in various communities, beach and park cleanup activities, and a COVID-19 vaccination drive in 2021. From Eva Beach, Hawaii, I'm USNS Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Thank you, Mio. Meanwhile, a triptych by British painter Francis Bacon, of one of his muses, sold for 24.3 million pounds or 27.9 million euros at an auction in London. Take a look. Entitled Three Studies for Portrait of Henrietta Moraes, it's composed of three small canvases, roughly 35 centimeters by 30 centimeters. It served as studies for a portrait of Henrietta Moraes. Until now, the studies were owned by the William S. Paley Foundation of the U.S. businessman who founded the CBS television network. The 1963 work was estimated at 30 million pounds. And finally, in our news, social media was filled with reactions. After DC's Black Adam was unveiled to a New York audience following its premiere at AMC Empire 25 in Manhattan. To recall, at the Comic Con, Warner Studios also gave fans a glimpse of the much-anticipated film Black Adam, Dwayne Johnson's first superhero work. Take a look. Uh, what makes Black Adam different is that this brother has his own code, which you're going to see and thoroughly enjoy. He dances to the beat of his own drum. You know, he is not based in our time. You know, he's still somebody with a mindset from 5,000 years ago from whence he came. So you get a different perspective on what it means to be someone in charge, someone who redefines the definition of superhero. But uh, in terms of like an anti-hero, someone who still has a moral compass and on the big screen, we've never seen anything like Black Adam and something that powerful that really disrupts the universe. That's, no. that's something we're really excited about bringing to the screen. To seek justice. And, you know, Dwayne has this real, this magical quality that, that we love and admire. He has this incredible instinct. He has a, he has a really unique gut where it's like, and he knows his fans and he knows what his fans want. So sometimes when we're pitching around on ideas, Dwayne will kind of catch one and hear one and be like, that's it. And he's always he's always right. He's always right. Um, in a very serious, you know, universe of DC, where we've had a lot of awesome dramas and things like that, we were kind of like the first comedy, if you will, you know. And I think that was that was fun and fresh. And we're just going to keep doing that. <laughs> and don't screw with the formula because people want that DNA. Sometimes you go make a sequel and you know people go too big and too much, and it's like it's not the same movie anymore. And we wanted to keep bringing the same heart and the same humor. So we did. The official review embargo for Black Adam lifts next week, but the social media embargo for early reactions lifted after the premiere. One, uh, hashtag Black Adam is DC's most action-packed film to date. It's a non-stop thrill ride that is all about spectacle and it knows it. There is barely any time to breathe or even talk. At the Rock is a perfect Black Adam, plus Pierce Brosnan is a standout. The film will leave fans buzzing. 
According to The Hollywood Reporter, the film stars Dwayne Johnson as the titular DC anti-hero Black Adam, who has been imprisoned for 5,000 years before being freed into modern times. Directed by Spanish director Jaume Colet Serra, The Shallows Orphan, Black Adam is the 11th film in the DC Extended Universe. The film also stars Aldous Hodge as Hawkman, Noah Centineo as Adam Smasher, Sarah Shai as Isis, Marwan Kenzari as Sabak, Quintessa Swindle as Cyclone, and Pierce Brosnan as Dr. Fate. Producer Bo Flynn said earlier this month that because of the Justice Society, Black Adam has a similarity with Doctor Strange in the universe of madness. Black Adam arrives in theaters on October 21st. Take a look. You have two parts. You can be the destroyer of this world. Or you can be its savior. As always, I'll end the day on a thoughtful note. Our ability to look back and smile at our past is proof that God's plan is to keep us moving forward. This has been Eagle News International. I'm Alma Angeles. Stay alert, stay informed, because we live in extraordinary times. Good night.